And welcome to the breakdown right here on Canadian Football Perspective. I'm at TSN underscore Marsh, Marshall Ferguson. That is at DT on SC. For now, we'll see what happens. Derek Taylor, the voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on 680 CJOB in Van... Uh, it was almost said in Vancouver because we were talking about Vancouver and the BC Lions right before. I almost moved you to Vancouver, DT. Whoa. <laughs> My wife would be overjoyed. She loves Vancouver <laughs> like nothing else. Riding bikes along the seawall, some rented bike with a giant puffy seat. Uh, that's a that's a truly great memory. Uh, I had a moment of fear as we were playing the intro there, which, by the way, what you heard in that intro was the sound of DT and I calling football games, which we hope to be simultaneously doing coming up this Friday evening because the Riders and the Bombers... And that's the game that you have scheduled. Writers at the Calgary game. I've, I've even looked. It's uh, this weekend. Uh, Friday is the Bombers hosting the Elks. Tuesday is the oh. Bombers at the Riders. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So Bombers. That was the rescheduled one that got bumped to the thirty first. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is Bombers Elks. The DT will have, and then I'm supposed to have Ottawa Toronto. Uh, I'm actually getting in the car Thursday morning, driving east towards the sun hoping that a football game breaks out somewhere in the distance. Uh, And I I will be staying at my parents' place in Kingston on Thursday night. And there's a chance that if all hell breaks loose in a way that neither of us hope that it will, uh, that I'm sitting in Kingston Thursday at midnight reading Twitter. And I see a Dave Naylor tweet come across that says, Hey, sorry guys. And then I get back in the car and I drive back to Hamilton. (laughs) Get a beaver tail while you're in Ottawa and then come back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think my potentially my Friday might be a little more interesting. Um, there are thoughts that Edmonton may want to start Trey Ford in Friday's game. Trey Ford and his brother Tyrell Ford, Bombers defensive back, who's like third string, whatever, right now. Yep. The Ford brothers in the first preseason game? That would be that would be all right. Let's. That's why, if nothing else, uh, plus all the reasons that you and I want to watch football, this CFL CFLPA thing needs to be solved. Just solve it for DT and Marsh. Exactly. Boom, just get it done. We, we love we, you guys. We just want to call football games. <laughs> like it's, right. It's been a long time since we've been able to do that. But let's let's dig in a little bit here uh, off the top. As I do remind you, of course, that our good friends at Fox Forty make this podcast possible. We want you to go over to their website. Of course, it is fox40shop.com. Use the promo code CFP15 at checkout to get fifty. Percent off of your order, custom logoed whistles, gear, coaching boards, and a whole heck of a lot more stop whistles, stopwatches, ball pumps, whatever you need. It's there. It's good equipment. Get it. Use our promo code that lets them know that you like the show. And it also lets them know that uh, you like their stuff, which helps us. Uh, all ball right. pumps, eh? There's so, ball pumps? Might as well, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> Google ball pumps for a little bit. Don't Google that. No, no. Oh, sorry. Not on a work computer at the very least. Uh, but yeah, I let's dig in here a little bit on where we were last time we did the show last week where we're going, Hey, the deal is in place. They're going to vote this thing. And we talked through the different machinations of how the coaches might work their way around things and might find different possibilities to try and skirt it. You and I both on last week's show said this 49% thing, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And I, I think we are both in agreement that if this pushback from the players association, which is a headache to everybody, if it results in a headache that eliminates trying to track, follow up on, figure out the 49%, the three naturalized, the this, the that, the, if we can simplify stuff, I think everybody would be a little bit happier in the grand scheme of things, even if you don't realize it right now, down the road, five, six, seven years, 
people I think will be, th- oh man, we dodged a bullet by not having to yeah. go through that 49% thing, right? Yeah, we, as you and I talked about it, I said five, it's five and a half Canadians, right? Because three naturalized players, of which every team has a bunch of them, could play 49% of snaps. And and teams, though they don't have a ton of just remainder Americans on their, their game day roster, they would have figured it out. They would have yeah. figured out how to have 20 Americans on the field in the, in the final few minutes of a game. I have no doubt about that at all. And I started seeing uh, players talk about five and a half Canadians. So they came to the same conclusion that I did of, oh, wait a minute, you're, you're going to take guys off the field. Uh, it's now, you know, the proposal is six plus one. Uh, we can talk about that one because something interesting was brought to me yesterday about the one. But it's six Canadians down from seven or up from five and a half or up from zero, depending on how you want to look at it. But there were seven Canadians on the field last season. Uh, if this proposal goes through, there'll be six this year, which I'm the math guy. That's one one fewer. Oh. So it's not great, but that seems like where we're going in the Canadian Football League. Yeah, and, and I also realize that the players association, this group of Canadian players do not want to be the ones that open the door to a ratio reduction. Okay, I understand that. I also know that this is the minimum, not the maximum. And so my place is, yeah, if you're guaranteeing one less Canadian as a starting spot, in theory, that sounds like, yeah, we're tearing down the ratio, we're crushing it, we're moving forward. I'm here to tell you, I would be shocked this year, especially, but really in future years, if there were not more than six Canadians starting. And the reason that I say that is, I think on every team, you can find somewhere, depending on the strength of your roster, from five to eight Canadians that are because let's be real about this if they drop it down to six from seven you're not going to reduce the number of rounds that you have in the cfl draft you're not going to reduce the number of university feeder programs there are in canada all of that stuff is still going to continue you're still going to continue to produce players it's just going to mean that it's more competitive to have those starting spots when you create competition and you continue to have the same amount of players available in my mind i'm not saying that the kid from you know st fx is going to necessarily beat out the guy that comes from the university of texas at austin but what i'm saying is if you're going to have a relatively similar number of Canadian players on the roster, I would be shocked if there's not somewhere between six to eight on every roster that's playing, especially once, and you know this, DT, when we get into the thick yeah. of the season and there's injuries, like if you're, if you're a starter, statistics will show throughout the course of the season, you are going to lose somewhere. If you have 24 starters, 12 on each side of the ball, you're going to lose somewhere between three to five of those guys for a significant chunk of time, like somewhere across the board. If you have quality Canadians on your roster already, which teams do, I understand why everybody's like, oh, they're tearing it down. They're eliminating the Canadians. I'm here to tell you, that's the minimum. That's not the maximum. And so I understand the hesitation, but I also believe Mm. that Canadian players are of a high enough caliber on most rosters that it would not necessarily be struck to six and then get eroded to five and then be three. And then I, I just don't feel that way. The, the question I have, and, uh, no surprise, I poured through all the Bombers depth charts from 2016 to present. When they went more than seven Canadians last season, it was because of injury. Yeah. Kyrie Wilson was out. Jesse Briggs got in and, and started. Uh, this time, it'll be Brandon Alexander is, is injured for a part of the season. So Nick Hallett will, will maybe start at safety. They'll do something in that thing. The Bombers looked like they were a seven, seven Canadian team, six on offense, Jake Thomas on defense, until injuries came in. Uh, the Riders had games last year where eight, and I think there was a game where they had nine. But again, that was injuries. If Shaq Evans had been there, if Larry Dean hadn't torn his Achilles in training camp, I, I feel like they would have been a, a seven Canadian team. Uh, and I that ends up being, I suspect, because you have these Canadians there because they're on your roster. They're your great special teams players. They're your depth players. And who else is next man up besides these Canadian guys? I feel like... I don't have anything to, to back it up, but coaches are American coaches are going to like American players. Oh, just I for agree with that. Re- yeah. re- reasons you and I have talked about endlessly, ten times the population, la 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 training. Um, I every every team is going to try to get to six. In I just believe every team is going to try to get to six in their ideal lineup. Which, to your point, the Riders had 16, 17 guys on a six game injured list last year. Seasons end up being far from ideal. Yes. It's the same reason why I always laugh at like this week I for CFL.ca I wrote about training camp battles. And as I wrote it, I was like, I'm gonna look back at this in a month and it's gonna seem so stupid. 
because <laughs> everybody is so, this is always the way that the a football season goes at any level. You are so focused on who's our starter in free agency. It's who's going to start for us. It's you just experience it with Mercy Maston. Like yep. you're looking at your whole, you're like in the grand scheme of things, we are going to cultivate this exact roster and this is where people will play and this is how they will play. And then reality goes and you're there in week two and you're like, oh shit, no, we got to make move. We got to, the roster's got to change. We got to bounce this guy to that. Well, we got to bring somebody up off the practice roster. We got to sign somebody. We got like, and, yeah. that, and that's why I say that, yes, they're going to try to get it down to six because the American coaches, as you say, will always lean towards the American players. But Micah tights to me is a fantastic example of this where it's like, yeah. he's there, he's lingering on special teams. And he just happens to get his shot. They're like, well, damn, I don't know what else to do. He goes in. Larry Dean went down. Yeah. yeah, He balls out throughout the whole year. And it's like, and this is what I find interesting too, is if we're not going to reduce the number of rounds that there are in the CFL draft, if you're going to essentially carry the same number of Canadians on your roster at large, albeit reducing the number of starters, then in the draft, do you think that Jeremy O'Day, do you think that Kyle Walters, are going to go into the draft and say, let's just draft all the special teamers because we only need six Canadians. They're still oh, going no. to, they're right. They're still going to draft the best football players available coming out of the NCA, U Sports, Juco, whatever it might be that are eligible in the, in the CFL draft. And if they are drafting them as the best players available and somebody goes down with injury, like you say, then you're up to seven, eight guys that are Canadians that are starting anyway. I just, I don't get as hung up on the number because I think I see past the number and the reality of what happens in the football season and how we're still going to continue to grow the caliber of Canadian talent. Dropping Mm -hmm. a number in a CBA is not going to kill all of the great work that's been done by so many people. It's going to take one person off of the field until somebody else gets hurt. And then you're right back to where you were before that. That's the thing for me that just, it doesn't give me that much concern. The number's there for a reason, though, right? Of course, like the yeah. number's been – it was uh, – I was talking to Farhan Lons. He said it used to be 10 when he he remembers 10. I only remember seven Canadians, and now we're, we're about to get to no six. Like, the number's there for a reason. Uh, and, 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 I mean, you could you could hypothesize a zillion reasons why that is. Well, American players are better than Canadian players. Well, American coaches will favor American players over over Canadian players or – what whatever you might come up with the reasons it's seven you have to have seven it's got to be seven stop trying to cheat seven it's it's seven but now it's now it's six you go okay well it's it's to it's to keep balance and to keep the canadian football league canadian like i i was i was going through uh, some other leagues uh did we talk about this apart from ml mlb nba nhl nfl uh english premier league football you have to have a certain number of english players on your team. They used to be really strict on that. They're less strict now, but that's one of the top soccer leagues in the world. You need a certain number of English players because this is English football. Uh, if not for ratios in other sports, American basketball players would just own every Asian basketball league there was and probably every African basketball league there was because an owner would come in and, hey, let's spend some money and bring in this guy who played at Texas Tech and boom, we're going to win the title, right? You just ratios exist everywhere for a reason is to protect our talent because like you and I talked about, we're huge fans of the game at all levels and having Canadian, having watching and seeing Tanner, Tanner Cadwallader, a guy I just met a couple of days ago, running in special teams drills and being the backup will linebacker. There's some guy, there's some kid watching that some guy, some gal watching that going, I want to be Tanner. Yeah. And that's, we need that. We, we absolutely need that. I, I'll be curious to see how how hard we go six, how hard coaches go six this season, and where they go six because we're used to seven, right? Interior offensive line, defensive tackle, safety, Z plus one. Well, which which Canadian is generally coming off the field? Uh, we'll still have Canadian long snappers in literally every game in 2019, and I assume 21. But uh, where's that? Where are we losing that Canadian, or where do teams choose to take? to put an American on the field if it does go six. Well, that's the funny thing is the idea that if if you don't know where players are from and you just walk out to a practice field in the CFL, can you tell who the Canadian is and who the American is? There are very specific instances where you're like, yeah. Like you see an American defensive end like Willie Jefferson, you're like, I don't think he's from Anaganish. I'm pretty sure. Like, the, I, I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that he is not of – this place uh and then there's other times where you see a chris van zyle if i didn't know chris van zyle was 
uh, a Canadian, I would look at him, a big body, can move, veteran presence in the locker room. I'd be like, I don't know. And mm. so now the question becomes, okay, yeah, offensive lineman, defensive tackle, free safety, Z, one other, whatever it might be. It's like if you take the wide side wide receiver who's a Canadian and you're like, we're going to take that guy off the field. It, I, and realistically, it's probably going to be more offensive linemen because I think if you are trying to up this, is just talking strategically, no comment on the caliber of Canadian talent versus American in certain positions. But if you're trying to, in your mind, upgrade the talent because you are switching out a Canadian for an American in some coaches' minds, which even the terminology on that kind of pisses me off, but whatever. Um, if you were to do that, you'd probably want the upgrade to be closer to the ball, right? Because you might not want it to be your wide side wide receiver. You would want it in the trenches or wherever you think it's going to make the biggest impact. But let's yeah. say you, you take the wide side wide receiver off the field. And instead of having Mike Jones out there, who I, I wouldn't know if he was Canadian or American in Edmonton, you take him off and you throw in a guy that they picked up from division three Mount union, purple Raiders. I'm not going to know the difference. And that's why this is a bit of a funny conversation to me as well as we, yeah. go from, we go from seven to six. And the question becomes, what is the tangible difference on our game? And yeah. And the average fan is not going to have a damn clue. And the real fan is not going to have a damn clue because it's one person. No. And every time that one person makes a big play, which is tough to tell when you're an offensive line, defensive line, but it's like, if you were able to start an American at free safety and they make an interception, People will be like, well, that's why we went from seven. To, we put an extra American on the field. Look at the play he made. And then the question's going to yeah. be, yeah, but could Nick Hallett not have made that play? Yeah, those are all nonsense, right? Those are all <laughs> one instance, small sample size nonsense. You, you, you make me think of something just by saying that. Will teams attack uh, if it does become six Canadians? Will they attack it strategically? Like the Z receiver is now an American? Or will they attack it from a salary cap perspective? Because... There's significant gains to be made. If you could have a left guard who you pay this, the league minimum to instead of $180,000 to a Canadian, right. 205, wh whatever salaries are for Canadian, maybe that's the way they, they're going to go at it and go, oh, you know what, We're, we are going to be three on the offensive line because we feel like we can find a young American guard on, a, on this first contract to come up and crush it for us like Travis Bond did for the Bombers back in – what was that? 15, 16, stuff like that. Um, maybe that's the way they go and save a hundred grand on the cap and spend that money somewhere else. Yeah. I think that money will play a huge, huge role in this. It also though makes me just long for, and again, this is why I think the ratio is important because I don't want it to seem like, I don't think it's important is Brandon Revenberg's a hell of a player, but he's got little alligator arms and, and he, bowling ball and fights with people in the trenches and gets hands on him and moves his feet. And it's like that guy makes a decent amount of coin. It's not like he's going to get released. You're not going to be like, screw you. We don't care about you anymore at all. He's a mm. top, he's a top flight player. He'll stay. But if I'm looking at the other guard spot right now for the tie cats, it's like, it might be Kyle Saxlid if they go American at left tackle. If they decide to go Saxlid at left tackle, then maybe they end up going with a significantly cheaper guy than even a Jesse Given or a Colter Woodmancy, because like you say, those guys might not be top flight, but they're Canadian offensive linemen. And you're going to save a little bit of money, and then you can disperse it to other places that, I mean, this might be the backdoor way of them trying to get quarterbacks up here. Let's be real about that. If you're saving yourself a bigger chunk of money on the offensive line, you think you're getting the same caliber mm. of pr protection, and then you're reallotting that money to try and offer more money to get bigger names to come up and play in the Canadian football league. I don't know. Everything's on the table when you start talking about moving and shaking and shifting money. And because even before we came on, we were here for two seconds and, and we were saying the ratification bonus seems like it's a big one. And I said, I just imagine or envision the idea of congratulations. The ratification bonus is in, you've signed the paperwork. It's been ratified. We're going into training camp. Also, can we renegotiate your contract? Because we've just cut the salary cap by $50,000 this year. And it's, it might not be specific and it might not be impactful for certain guys. I don't think teams will be petty enough to go to every player and say, we have to cut $2,500 off your salary this year. Yeah. But I just, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it seems like they really want money up front. That's fair. I'd love to have money up front too on calling football games this year. That'd be great. But at what cost, I guess, are you trying to get that money up front? Yeah, it's, and it came from, we really hadn't heard it, right? And you see CFL PA reps talking about you know, the six things that uh, our members pointed out to us. We got them all. And then all of a sudden, like, I hadn't heard ratification bonus until 
I didn't know that was a thing until I don't even Sunday. I don't was even. Su- I don't know. Sunday? I don't know business. And yeah. So the idea that you would need to bribe the membership to be able to sign something because you're saying if you do, we've got a little bit of money over yeah. here for you. Like that to me, it makes a lot of sense in business practice, but because I don't have experience in business, I was like, Oh yeah, of course that would be a thing. But then when I learned that they had taken the ratification bonus off the table and taken that money elsewhere and put it into salary cap and shifted it. And then the players were like, no, we want our money now. I was like, Mm. I don't want to say it seems short sighted because I get it. But at the same time, I was like, this doesn't seem like something worth voting it down for. Like that was the frustration for me. And I understand there are a lot of other elements at play and we don't have the finite details on every little thing in every locker room around the country that was concerned about. But if the ratification bonus actually played a sizable chunk in this, that just yeah. kind of seems like dudes wanted some cash in their hands. Well, when you look at, when you look at the numbers as it came out, it was 450 grand comes off this year's cap, nine teams times uh, $50,000. Right. And then in the last, was it 2028? 75 grand comes off every team's cap, which is nine times 75, $675,000. Add those two together, $1.125 million. Uh, I would way rather have a uh, million dollars now than in this uh, $1.125 million that's fair, six yeah. years from now, seven years from now. That's, that's to me, that's not even close. And especially, and that's me thinking I'm going to use that money. Some of these guys won't be around at that time. Uh, I was part of a union once and they, we were offered a ratification bonus and we all jumped at it because we thought it was amazing. And our, our union rep had said, he, he said it absolutely the wrong way to people who were making like 30 grand. He's like 2,500 bucks. Isn't a lot of money. And I thought, well, okay, that's stupid because it is yeah. uh, to people make 30 grand. It is. But I think his point was if you're conceding money in the long term, Getting twenty five hundred bucks today isn't isn't much. If it costs you twenty grand over the life of your contract, why did you bother on twenty five hundred bucks today? To me, and again, we haven't seen it, but to think, hey, you're sacrificing six seventy five potentially six years from now, and four hundred fifty grand this year to get a million dollars right now. You're paying five fifty to get six. In, to you're paying. Pardon me. You're essentially getting five fifty now instead of six seventy five six years from now. That's that seems like on that that's good math in my books because money now you can do a lot of things with it in six years. And my question, I guess, is: Do you think that the average guy who doesn't even check their email to vote on the CBA is doing that math? Because it's <laughs> no, no it's, but I do, and they can call me. And yeah, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I hope they. I hope they are. Adam Big Hill, third vice president, is a financial planner. Uh, you can yeah. I don't. I, I you have a really good point there because uh, I I agree with you, and I think that it's smart. And I think that over the long haul, like everything that you just explained is true. But then I, I see, you know, 30 to 35 percent of the PA did not vote. And there were people saying it's a slap in the face of the people that did and all the rest. Um, have you looked at the NHL voting percentages last time that they put through no. their, their CBA? Because it was worse than 35 percent. Like some to, yeah. to be able to have and, and the more awareness that there is on this, I guarantee that you're going to have somewhere 20 to 25 maximum won't vote on this next one. Those are just dudes, and this is funny too. There's a great quote from, from uh, Dan Levitard of the Levitard Show on Metal Arc Media where he says, the presidential elections in the United States and various other things, and they always put poll questions up on their social media. He said, we can get 30% of people to vote or not vote for anything. He said, like 30% is this market. You can always get two thirds or one third either way, depending on what the topic is. And I believe in my heart of hearts that if I were to look at, a CFL training camp field. There's all these bodies. You know, I go to Ticats practice. There's these gold uniforms. There's these black uniforms. There's all these guys, different shapes and sizes and positions and backgrounds. You look at all these bodies. And if you were to say to me, 25% of these guys just don't give a shit what's going on. Like they're here to, you know, the guys you've met from mostly the Americans from the States who are just there to ball. Like they, they are there to play football and they're, they're like, I don't know what all this noise is. I just came to a country I've never been to before. I'm living in a dorm at McMaster University and I'm just here to do my thing and make this team. And then people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but like check, you know, check your email. And I understand like the whole idea of rookies not having the same say in CBA voting and all the rest um, because they're not necessarily part of the Players Association because they haven't made a club and signed a contract. Well, but the idea of younger guys who come in and are focused on football, I really think a lot of them are just kind of like, 
yeah, like things are going to come, things are going to go. I'm going to do my very best to make this team. And I'm not as socially aware or involved in the decision-making process around my team, I guess. Yeah. yeah uh, to me, you have the right to be unplugged. I thought it, I caught yeah. me off guard that 30% didn't vote, but some, some, some players just don't care. Like, and, and that to me is fun. They're here to play football. So give me a paycheck. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm on a rookie deal. I want to earn the next one. I, I kind of get it. Cause I mean, Anybody who has not voted in a municipal, anybody who's not voted in a municipal election, I assume nationwide, those turnouts are terrible. Those are the <laughs> politicians that impact your life more than anybody. Yeah. And if you don't vote for your, your counselor in your ward, then, uh, yeah, I, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. What, what do you think of the plus one? And it's sold as a way to reward American players who commit long term. I was, I was talking to, uh, forgive me if he didn't want me to out it, but I was talking to Farhan Lalji yesterday. He's the first one who brought this up to me. He's like, right. how is it actually going to help an American player? And I said, well, you know, it's a benefit to being, yeah, but but really, is that going to matter to the American players? Because once you have three years with a team or five years and you're an American, aren't you pretty much a star player at that point? You should be. Like, I, I don't think you're lingering on the back end of a roster if you're three, five years in, and especially on the same team, because if you're not a good enough player to stick around on the same team, they're not going to resign you. So, right. so that's the, like, yeah, there's a certain caliber of player. There's not a whole lot of like I'm trying to think of mediocre dude who's been on the same CFL team, resigned four times over five years, who's lingering as a third stringer. Like, it, it's a Daryl like, Morey. Has a, yeah. has a saying where he says, um, essentially, by the time that you get to your third year in the NBA, they'll know what you are. I kind of think that's yeah. the same with professional football. Like, if, if you are... Micah Awe. How about Micah Awe? <laughs> there's a guy who's probably been in the league five years. Yeah. But yeah, not to say he's mediocre or anything, but there's a guy who's not a, not a guaranteed starter who ke- who keeps popping up on rosters because coaches like him. Yep. But there there's a guy. Yeah, that's There's a name great. we can attach to it. Uh, before we get out of here, I do want to ask you uh, for your two cents on Jalen Saunders uh, and the release, because you've seen him up close and personal. I saw you tweeting that he was yeah. getting a little bit of running Greg Ellingson's spot as well. I obviously sitting here uh, in Ontario have not had a chance to see him since he was on the field last in the CFL. Uh, what did you see? And do you think that the release was justified based on what you had seen? It's Training camps are so tough. So Saunders, Saunders and Ellingson play the same spot, right? They're both that wide receiver, which was going to be the first thing of, okay, how do we get them both on the field? Which to me was, where is Saunders going to move? Is he going to be the W, the slot receiver on the boundary side? Can he work from the set position, be the X? Um, He'd been consistently working with the second team. Uh, When Ellingson did not practice uh, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, so Saunders was in his, it looked like the Y on Sunday and Monday. And, you know, looked like a training camp, looked like it was a receiver in training camp where you're, you know, uh, as Mike O'Shea said, no defensive back is trying to crush you like they are in a game, yeah. right? So it looked all right. There was one deep ball that dropped, but you're not watching every rep, so they put too much on that. I, I was just surprised because he's not injured, though he took practice off yesterday. Saunders is not injured, uh, and the preseason game is two days away. So that's the timing is the part that, that caught me off guard the most. I, I could believe, okay, well, we don't, feel like Jalen could contribute but when guys don't get to the you know the preseason game Mm -hmm. typically they're injured or this isn't your time or this isn't your team so I uh, I'll be curious to hear what what coach O'Shea has to say about that because 2017-18 that guy played what 25 games and caught almost 2,000 yards Mm -hmm. he was a star and then it's been a very long road XFL COVID broken hip in a hit by a drunk driver i i wanted him back i i wanted him back for himself and i wanted him back because adding that 2018 jalen saunders to to this palmer's lineup would have been great yeah we were both super impressed by the signing it was so under the radar and so like if you're a championship organization and the patriots are always the model that people suggest when this conversation comes up of you don't think that they drafted well. Oh, they developed that guy. He turns out great. Or uh, they get the late season free agency signing that you're like, oh, of course they did. Like they're, they're always going to get the best guy at the best time. And that was one where I'm like, they lost Kenny Lawler in Winnipeg there. They get Greg Ellingson. And we're like, oh, of course they did. Of course, because that's that makes so much sense. Like that's going to turn out great. And then you mm-hmm. see Jalen Saunders added and Rasheed Bailey in the mix and Wolitarski and Nick Dembski. And you're like, 
oh man, like that's a that's a complete receiving core. They've got a little bit of everything, and there's all these moving pieces and so much speed, and there's some size, and there's and, and yeah, you see the release, and you're like, oh, they they didn't see that the same way that I think the average fan did in Winnipeg, because even the average fan, and this is one of those things when you're talking about guys that kind of dabble in different places in the CFL. If you are a Bombers fan and a Bombers fan only, you got the blinders on, and you just know Winnipeg, and you just go to Win- Winnipeg games. He's one of those rare American receivers that isn't a superstar, is not name brand Shaq Evans, Reggie Bagleton, Duke Williams, but he is a name you would know. Mm. Like, because if you're watching your team play or you're watching your team play on, the, on CFL and TSN, you are going to know who Jalen Saunders was because he was a prevalent part of an important, highly talented, high caliber 2018 Ticats offense. And for him to get dropped after he's a name that you know, I think even the average fan today was going, sorry? Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, we could, we could hypothesize, but I don't want to cast anything on right. him about returning from that car crash. I uh, well, part, it, Yeah. It was a car crash. His car was struck yeah. by a drunk driver is, is the report. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, he, he, he did not, he fit in. Yeah. He seemed to fit in in everything. And, he didn't look out of place running with the first team with the Bombers when Ellingson was taking a couple of days off. So, yeah, uh, I hope for his sake he's healthy enough that some other team gives him a chance. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and he wants that chance. But but he's been through uh, he has been through a lot since uh, the midpoint of the 2018 season when he tore up. It was it was his knee he tore up in 18. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I think I was calling that game on radio against the Red Blacks. And, yeah, it was uh, one of those that was just like nasty and unfortunate. But. Anyway, see, I'm with you. I hope that we see him back on the field soon because he is he is a fun player and uh, and I'd like to see him make his way back into the fold. But uh, hopefully DT and I are calling games coming up Friday night. Uh, follow him on social media at DT on SC. Uh, that's where you can get the update on Jalen Saunders and everything Mike O'Shea has to say. And you did your first coaches show, did you not? I did. Yeah. Uh, technical wobble off the top, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I got a good got a, our first uh, first hour with Coach O'Shea. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun because he's going to teach us a lot of stuff. Awesome, six eighty CJOB in Winnipeg uh, is where you can go to be able to get all of the goods from DT. Uh, follow me at TSN underscore Marsh. I don't tweet much these days until the season actually starts because I have nothing to say until we start actually playing football. So uh, I'm not that entertaining on there, but I do want you. Uh, to give some love again to our good friends at Fox 40, go over there, fox40shop.com, CFP15 at checkout, 15% off of your order. Fingers crossed. We'll talk to you all on Friday. Him on CJOB, me on TSN. We'd like to call some football games.